The Holy Tsar Martyr Nicholas Alexandrovich Romanov, Nicholas II, was born on May 6, 18, 1868 in Tsarskoye Silo. He was the eldest son of Emperor Alexander III and Empress Maria Fyodorovna. The future emperor received a brilliant education. He knew five foreign languages, studied Russian and world history, understood military affairs, was a widely erudite person. Nicholas II came to the throne on October 21, 1894 at the age of 26. The fate of this noble, beautiful man was deeply tragic. The future king was born on the day when the Orthodox Church celebrates the memory of St. Job the Long-Suffering. The king attached special importance to this coincidence, since he keenly felt that his fate would be similar to the martyrdom life of the righteous Job. I have more than a premonition, he said, that I am doomed to terrible trials. Nicholas II passed these tests with honor, preferring death to betrayal of Christ and Russia. Faith in Christ the Savior was the basis of the worldview of Emperor Nicholas II. Personal faith for him was associated with the mandatory implementation of the rules established by the Church, visiting the temple and prayer. According to contemporaries, Nicholas Alexandrovich began and ended his day with prayer. Protopresbyter George Shevelsky, who communicated with the Emperor in Stavka during the World War, testified to the humble, simple and direct religiosity of the Tsar, to his strict attendance of Sunday and festive services. Nicholas II often made pilgrimage trips to churches and monasteries in many places of the country, reverently worshipped local shrines, holy relics and miraculous icons, participated in celebrations in memory of many Russian saints and church events. On July 18, 1903, the royal couple visited Sarov to glorify Seraphim of Sarov. Like his great-grandfather, Emperor Nicholas I, he was submissive to the providence of God. He believed that providence itself controlled his actions. At that time, Russian high society was infected with mysticism, occultism, Freemasonry, socialism. Many representatives of the then aristocracy and high-ranking officials from the royal entourage were only listed as Christians, but in reality were indifferent to religion. Against this background, the emperor's devotion to orthodoxy seemed to them to be sanctimony. They condemned the emperor and empress Alexandra Fyodorovna for excessive, in their opinion, religiosity. Filled with unshakable faith in the providence of God, the last Russian autocrat miraculously combined both courage and gentleness. According to people who knew him closely, he had exceptional self-control. No one had ever seen him in anger. When the temporary workers were preparing to accuse him of treason to the motherland, someone offered to publish the personal correspondence of Nicholas Alexandrovich and the Empress, to which he received an answer, you can't, then people will recognize him as a saint. For Nicholas II, the idea of power, the embodiment of which he realized it existed inextricably with the idea of God. Nicholas Alexandrovich viewed his political activity as a religious service, and treated the performance of the duties of the king as a sacred duty. He felt the responsibility for the country that providence had given him. In Holy Russia, the Tsar was not only the head of the state, but also the father of the Russian people, who lovingly called him, the Tsar's father, expressing his kinship with God's Christ. Thanks to the secret of the anointing, the king's relationship with God and his unity with his people was strengthened. General A. wrote, Masola, the emperor was a very moral man, a wonderful family man, and never allowed himself to have side affairs. The last Russian Tsar Nicholas II felt this mystical relationship with God and the people. According to the testimony of Mrs. S. Buxkevden, Dot had an innate sympathy for the common people, especially the peasants. If the Tsar viewed the Duma members as mere intellectuals, then his attitude to the peasant delegations was completely different. The Tsar met them willingly and for a long time, without fatigue and with joy and tenderness, wrote General Amosola. The emperor knew that the Orthodox faith is the foundation on which the Russian state rests, and always remembered the dying commandment of his father Alexander III. In domestic politics, first of all, the protection of the church. She repeatedly saved Russia in the years of tribulation. 
It may be faith in God and the sanctity of your royal duty as the foundation of your life for you. And the Sun Emperor meticulously fulfilled his father's will, showing us the image of a Christian king. In accordance with the laws of the Russian Empire, he was the secular leader of the Russian Church, and therefore he paid great attention to its needs, generously donating his personal funds to the construction of new churches, in, including outside Russia. The emperor understood where the temples were especially needed. Thus he wrote in the report submitted to him, the work of church building in Siberia is especially close to my heart. I want every church to have a school. The number of churches during the reign of Nicholas II increased by more than 10,000, and by the end of the reign there were 67,000. The number of monasteries increased by 250, there were 1,025 of them nationwide. Ancient temples have been updated. The emperor himself participated in the construction of new temples and the dedication of many. For example, laying the first stone in the foundation of the Kiev Cathedral in honor of St. Nicholas, the piece of the Lycian wonderworker. The Russian church during the reign of the last emperor had a tremendous influence, patronizing Orthodox Christians not only in Europe, but also in Asia and even in Africa. The Tsar approved the charter on pensions and allowances for clergymen and psalmists. In 1913, during the celebration of the 300th anniversary of the House of Romanov, Tsar Nicholas II called the Theological Academies imperial. He supported any initiatives for the development of Russian spirituality, supported the activities of the Imperial Palestine Society, which provided an opportunity for a large number of believers from all over Russia to make chief pilgrimages to the Holy Land. During the reign of Emperor Nicholas II, the church hierarchy was able to practically prepare the convocation of the local council, the main purpose of which was to restore the patriarchate in Russia. In January 1906, he established a pre-conciliar presence, and by the highest order of February 28, March 12, 1912, at the Holy Synod, a permanent pre-conciliar conference, until the council is convened. During the years of his reign, more saints were canonized than in the two previous centuries, when only five saints were glorified. During his last reign, Saint Theodosius of Chernikov, 1896, Saint Seraphim of Sarov, 1903, Saint Princess Anna of Kashin, Restoration of Veneration in 1909, Saint Yoasaf of Belgorod, 1902, Saint Hermogenes, Patriarch of Moscow, 1913, Saint Pitarum of Tombov, 1914, and Saint John of Tobolsk, 1916, were canonized as saints. At the same time, the emperor showed special perseverance, seeking the canonization of Saint Seraphim of Sarov, Saints Yoasaf of Belgorod and John of Tobolsk. Nicholas II highly honored St. John of Kronstadt, and after his blessed death ordered to perform a nationwide prayerful commemoration of the deceased on the day of his repose. About the death of John of Kronstadt, Nicholas II wrote, It was pleasing to the inscrutable providence of God that the great lamp of the Church of Christ and the prayer book of the Russian land, the universally revered shepherd and righteous father John of Kronstadt, should fade away. The Tsar granted complete freedom to the old believers, ordering in his decree to call them not schismatics, but old believers. An interesting entry made by Nicholas the heir in his diary during his long journey. Visiting the temples of the East, he wrote, Whenever I see a temple in which splendor, order and reverence are observed in the same way as ours, then at the entrance I unwittingly have the same religious mood as if I were in a Christian church. The ability to feel a different culture as one's own is extremely important for a person who in the future will become a white king, that is, a king for all subjects, regardless of religion. The king, striving to live according to the commandments of God, thereby showed his subjects an example to follow. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be pardoned, Matt. 5 to 7, says the Lord. Nicholas II did not reject a single petition for pardon that reached him. General A. A. Masolov noted, The Tsar was thoughtful about his rank of the Anointed One of God. It was necessary to see with what attention he considered requests for pardon of those sentenced to death. During the entire period of his rule, 
Fewer death sentences were imposed than in the USSR executed every six months, until Stalin's death. The number of prisoners in the country was much less than in the USSR or the Russian Federation. So, in 1908 there were 56 prisoners per 100,000 people, in 1940 to 1214, in 1949 to 1537, in 2011 to 555 people. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God, Matt. 5 to 9, says the Lord. Indicative as the emperor's desire for peace, expressed in a number of peace initiatives. Participation in the creation of the first ever Hague Convention on the reduction of conventional arms, the desire to preserve peace in Europe and throughout the world. The emperor did not want war and did everything to avoid Russia's participation in the war, which for her ended with the collapse of the empire and dynasty. It is not his fault that his good undertakings were thwarted by forces thirsty for profit, war and blood. On July 19, August 1, 1914, Germany declared war on Russia. Failures at the front in 1915 led to the fact that the Tsar assumed the title of Supreme Commander-in-Chief, replacing Grand Duke Nikolai Nikolaevich in this post. Thanks to the feat of the Tsar, Russia was close to victory in the First World War but betrayed by the top of the army, liberals from the Duma, allies, even many grand dukes, the Tsar was completely alone and was essentially deposed from the throne. In 1918, Saint Tikhon, patriarch of all Russia, stressed that the Tsar had abdicated power over the country, out of love for it. The life of Nicholas II was a Christian feat. From history we know that the holy princes Boris and Gleb, sons of the Kiev Grand Duke Vladimir, did not resist their elder brother Svitopolk, who killed them, eliminating rivals for the possession of the Grand Ducal throne. For their humility before God's will, for their unwillingness to internecine war, they were glorified as holy martyrs passion bearers. So did Emperor Nicholas II, who abdicated for the sake of tranquility of his beloved Russia. He was faced with a choice to abdicate or to march on Petrograd with the troops entrusted to him, the latter meant a civil war, which he did not go to. If I am an obstacle to the happiness of Russia and all the social forces currently standing at the head of it ask me to leave the throne and pass it on to my son and brother, then I am ready to do this, I am ready not only to give my kingdom, but also to give my life for the motherland, he told General D. N. Dubensky. In exile, many former generals, participants in the anti-monarchist conspiracy, in their memoirs, justifying themselves, accused Nikolai Alexandrovich of the fall of the empire, referring to his soft, Christian, compliance, his non-resistance and peace-loving character. But here is what Mikhail Koltsov, a member of the Central Committee of the CPSU, b. a famous Soviet writer and historical figure, wrote in 1927, there is no doubt that the only person who tried to persist in preserving the monarchical regime was the monarch himself. One king saved, defending the king. He didn't ruin it, he was ruined. Treason, cowardice, and deception are all around," wrote Nicholas II in his diary at the time. After the abdication of the sovereign, the disintegration of the people, who succumbed to base passions, began, and with unstoppable speed Russia rushed to destruction. The king was the mystical principle that held the forces of evil together. Now nothing prevented the entry into the world of the anti-Christian element. The Tsar and his family were arrested in Tsarskoy Silo. In the palace church, Father Athanasius Belave regularly celebrated the vigil and the divine liturgy. Now the humble servant of God Nicholas, like a meek lamb, benevolent to all his enemies, who does not remember his grievances, who prays diligently for the well-being of Russia, who believes deeply in its glorious future, kneeling, looking at the cross and the gospel, expresses to the Heavenly Father the innermost secrets of his long-suffering life and, plunging into dust before the greatness of the King of Heaven, tearfully asks for forgiveness in his free and involuntary transgressions. We read in the diary of Father Athanasius, Established on March 4, 1917, the Extraordinary Commission of Inquiry to investigate the illegal actions of the Tsar and former ministers did not find any evidence of treason or violation of the laws of the Russian Empire. Thus, 
both the arrest of the sovereign and the subsequent massacre of him and members of his family were acts of lawlessness. Interestingly, one of the members of this commission, after several weeks of work, admitted, What should I do? I'm starting to love the king. A year after the abdication, on March 15, 1918, Nicholas II wrote bitter words in his diary. How long will our unfortunate motherland be tormented and torn apart by external and internal enemies? It seems sometimes that there is no strength to endure longer, you do not even know what to hope for, what to do. And yet, no one like God. In confinement, the royal family, which endured all adversity, resentment and humiliation to the end, showed great humility, uncomplaining acceptance of suffering, nobility of soul and strength of spirit. Faith warmed the heart of the royal passion-bearer, ridiculed and dumbed down. The Tsar became like the ancient martyrs, who voluntarily made his way to Calvary in Yekaterinburg. To anticipate death, but not to despair and not to be embittered and to pray in an evangelical way for your executioners is a feat. Grand Duchess Olga conveyed in a letter from Tobolsh the words of her father, which became a testament for all of Russia. The father asked to convey to all those who remain loyal to him, and to those on whom they can have influence, so that they do not take revenge for him, since he has forgiven everyone and prays for everyone, so that they do not take revenge for themselves and that they remember, that the evil that is now in the world will be even stronger, but that it is not evil that will overcome evil, but only love. The sovereign and the empress believed, wrote Pierre Gilliard, the tutor of the heir Alexis, that they were dying martyrs for their homeland, they had died martyrs for mankind. Their true greatness did not stem from their royal rank, but from the amazing moral height to which they gradually rose. They became the perfect force, and in their very humiliation, they were astounding manifestation of that astonishing clarity of the soul against which all violence and all fury are powerless, and which triumphs in death itself. The king was and remained a Christian king to the end. The life of the sovereign after the abdication, the transfer of grievances, betrayals, pain for Russia and preparation for Christian death as the crown of the Christian crucifixion, service to God and the Russian state, which Tsar Nicholas II accomplished in previous years. And a living example of a truly Christian life for all of us. By canonizing Nicholas II, the Lord showed us that the last Russian Tsar fulfilled his duty to him and his people to the end. The last crowned ruler of Russia did everything to save it. It is no coincidence that Saint Periskova Diviavo said of him, he will be higher than all the kings.